Water White, Book One, Chapter Eight. Now she understood why the valley floor squished underfoot and the forest was drowning. The big water, aptly named, churned and steamed below her and for as far as she can see, but it was not like any ocean, she recalled. Its surface was silvery pink and gelatinous. An enormous wave rose in the distance and Celeste thought she could see through pores dotting the wall of water before it collapsed back into itself. They looked like glimmering tunnels. She could feel heat from the water's surface and smell a sulfurous stench, far worse than any rotten egg. Her parents had taken her to a hot spring as a child, but she'd never once heard of one so vast so vile, so strangely beautiful. Her black curls fell limp beneath her soggy scarf, and she thought she might be sick. Old Man Massive was right. There was no way she could swim across the expanse of water before her. She feared for the doves, too, seeing them begin to teeter. If she were to make it to the other side of the obstacle, a side she couldn't see, she'd have to move fast. Come with me, she said, lifting the woozy birds gently atop her pack. Orienting her compass and finding south, she jumped from the branch and looked to the sky. She had to get above the putrid fog over the roiling water quickly. She trusted she could fly to wherever she set her sights. Back in the crystal blue sky, she could see the sun was still above the western horizon. It had been a long day already. Why did it seem much longer than yesterday? But she had to get to the other side, and soon. Instinct took over once again, and she laughed aloud at how effortlessly she soared above and across the endless liquid that looked more like a science experiment run amok than a hot spring. The cool air refreshed her, and soon the doves were flying alongside, wings whistling as they increased their speed. For the first time in years, Celeste felt joyful, invincible even. Woohoo! She shouted to the sky, alternately leading, then following the birds, who echoed her with their own coo-coo. They flew for miles and miles as the sun neared the horizon, until finally Celeste spotted a stretch of land. The other side, she cheered, and soon the three travelers landed on a rocky beach. But it was not a beach at all. Celeste didn't have to walk far before realizing they had landed on a craggy mountaintop island surrounded by the steaming substance below. Her spirits sank and she slumped against a boulder. The faint smell of rotting eggs continued to waft its way up the rocks from far below, assaulting her senses. She was tired. How much farther? Since she had saved the birds, she'd hoped they'd finally talk to her. But they responded as before, cocking their little heads as if trying to understand. Celeste couldn't see land beyond the endless expanse of the bizarre ocean and was afraid. With shaky hands, she pulled the gray bag from her pack. In it was her diary. After the last two editions, she had shoved it below everything else in the pack, figuring she would make it more difficult for anyone, or anything, to find it. She hadn't written in it since running away from the home. She reviewed the unsolicited poems, one from friends, one from a foe. The cat's poem warned her of dangers and told her where she must go. South. 
The cats had also found a compass to guide her, without which she would have lost her way several times. She wondered why they had said she'd find her home. That she didn't believe. The shifter's poem was far more perplexing. She hoped her new name would keep her safe, but for how long? Would she have to be Paloma forever? Could the shifter recognize her by sight now, or did it need to hear her name? Its poem also said she wouldn't find her home. Those words she believed. Old Man Massive had told her she was important and had to find a key, but the shifter seemed pretty convinced she would fail. Relieved to find no new messages in her diary, Celeste pulled some cracker crumbs from the bottom of her pack for her silent partners and began her own entry. I'm lost. I'm afraid. I've run away from a safe place. At least I thought it was safe. And now a monster, they call it a shifter, is trying to kill me, but I don't know why. I'm sitting on an island in the middle of the most horrible water I've ever seen or smelled or imagined, and I need to get to the other side, but I don't know how far away it is or if I can make it. I'm tired, but I can fly and I can talk to animals, dogs and cats so far, and to mountains too. One mountain, that is. It's crazy, and it doesn't make any sense. People can't fly, can they? These doves won't talk to me, but they're still here, so I suppose that's a good thing. I can't stay here much longer because of the nasty smell. I wonder where everything went, and everyone, and why I can fly. Anyway, wish me luck. Good luck, she mumbled. The birds coo cooed, puffing out their feathers. Before locking her diary and storing it back in the bag and pack, she inked over her name on the inside cover. In her best handwriting, she wrote Paloma Elizabeth Newman. She decided it was a name she could live with. She hoped it was a name that would keep her alive. In her haste to get off the island, she didn't see her name tag fall from the pocket and stick between two rocks. Celeste shouldered her pack, opened her compass, and joined her airborne companions. They were all ready to leave the desolate island. Sure wish you'd say something. She wished the birds would reassure her somehow, but they simply started flying south. She took it as a sign of encouragement, since she hadn't even oriented her compass yet. When she saw they were heading in the right direction, she joined them. It can't be long now. She forced a cheerful attitude, wanting so very much to trust her own words. Time passed and the sun set below the horizon with no sight of land. She had no reason to doubt her flying ability, but hopelessness crept into her mind. The doves had perched back atop her pack, their little wings unable to continue the journey. Understanding how tired they must be, she thought of her own unbelievable adventure and felt true fatigue. Her fear was real, too, and panic seized her. How would she find land once darkness filled the sky? She wouldn't be able to see the arrow on her compass soon, and the thought of plunging into the squishy cauldron below terrified her. She lost altitude as her heart rate increased. She was losing control. The fog on the endless, horrible water below drew closer, and the smell grew stronger. She was dizzy and disoriented. Save yourselves! she called to her passengers. She was giving up. The shifter was right. There was no way she had any real power. 
For a brief instant, she thought she could hear the word melody from her dream. It sounded both playful and foreboding. Her head drooped, and she was ready to fall into the water. The doves rooed more adamantly than they had when they had warned her of the black vulture. Curious, Celeste lifted her head. She grinned at what she knew must be her final hallucination. For just ahead of her, in the air, was the largest, greenest frog she'd ever seen its emerald wings beating like a hummingbird's. Grab hold, ma petite, he called to her, extending his rear legs. His foreign voice sounded strangely familiar. Why not, she thought, grabbing hold. If the creature was a bad one, Grabbing onto his legs could be no worse than death by drowning in the bubbling ooze below. She had no idea how long she held on, but finally she felt a slowing of the breeze across her face, and then the blissful sensation of lying in warm, soft sand. In the darkness, she could see the outline of her savior sitting nearby, and hear her doves cooing softly. What's your name? she asked. Orville, she heard him croak, before falling into a slumber she couldn't elude. On the craggy island, hundreds of miles away, a black vulture landed. A white rectangular slip of paper with the name Celeste Araya Nolan waved like a little flag in the wind between two rocks. The shifter released a malicious, satisfied hiss. That ends chapter eight of book one.